What's up, y'all? Welcome back to the Tanner Farmstead Podcast. I am uh, really excited today about the guest I have on, Bill Wilson with Midwest Permaculture. Um, Bill, thank you for um, joining us. Just really, really excited to have you on. I consider you a, a mentor, and you, you've just had an impact on my my growing journey. And uh, so just thank you for, for taking the time to come on today. I really appreciate it. Well, delighted to be here. It's um, You inspired me too, Dirk. <laughs> you know, I, I, as a teacher, um, I get to see a lot of things and, um, and so I've learned a lot by watching what other people do, but, uh, any, you know, like you and you, any of your guests who come in that are on the front line that are figuring this stuff out on a week in, week out, year in, year out basis. That's the work. I mean, that's the miracle of cracking those nuts and figuring out how to do this in such a way that you're really growing really good food for people and you can, and you're making a living doing it. That is not easy. That is a real mountain to climb. So to anybody who's working on that, it is possible, but it takes a lot of skill and a lot of intelligence. you got to be sharp to be able to accomplish that. So anyway, it's a pleasure to to talk with you anytime about you know what it is you're doing as well. But I was uh, delighted when you signed up for the course. And I thought, <laughs> well, I hope this guy gets something out of this. Because you know, permaculture, people have uh, some of the definition for permaculture. It's, it's like... A, a glorified uh, gardening or something like that, you know, just kind of expanded gardening kind of a thing. And I mean, and, and it can be, but that's maybe 10% of what permaculture really is. And, yep. um, and so when you came on, I thought, well, he's probably looking for some tips or some quick, you know, how do I do this and make more money with, with what I'm doing? And I hope that, that, that the case is that that was, uh, that, 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 that did unfold, but um, permaculture is really, asking this larger question of that, how do we as humans, um, how do we participate as co-creators on this planet? I mean, it literally goes back to this point of, you know, I'll, I'll get a little spiritual here, but I mean, they say in some of those good books out there somewhere that we were created in the image and likeness of the creator, mm -hmm. which tells me we are creative beings. Yep. And we look at the world around us and we can see a tremendous amount of of deterioration, even destruction that we're doing in order to even just grow food by putting chemicals on the ground and, you know, herbicides, pesticides and leaving the ground fallow and losing soil through erosion. And, and, uh, but in other ways, the way we, we mine for in the mining industry, the, uh, um, the oil industry, the energy industry, and um, there's a tremendous amount of waste and a tremendous amount of pollution, even in the fishing industry and oceans. And we've, we see it everywhere. And that was what I was faced with growing up is looking at is how do we as humans live without destroying everything? Everywhere we turned, it looks like we're destroying everything. Yep. And it wasn't until I took a permaculture course that I was like, oh my gosh, there is a way that we as human beings can interact with the world and provide the security and abundance that we need as humans on this planet, while at the same time leaving it in better condition because we were here. I mean, quite literally. If all humans just walked away and the plant was left alone, you know, in a hundred years, it would repair a lot of the damage and it would come back and, you know, everything would flourish. If humans left, everything else would flourish. Yep. <laughs> but it is possible for us to show up and to participate in the world in such a way that we can be here and actually the world will be in better condition because we worked with the creator to co-create security and abundance, not just for us, but for all of life for all of wildlife as well as uh, human life. And that's what excites me. And so it's the whole picture. Permaculture is about how do we build our houses? How do we find energy? How do we use energy? You know, how do we have harvest water? How do we use water? Um, how do we build our businesses? How do we treat one another fairly? There's three basic ethics in permaculture. One is caring for the planet. Two is caring for one another, caring for people, and three is fair share is, was the original term, but a lot of people call it um, uh, caring for the future, mm -hmm. that if we don't extract too much and everybody has enough, we actually, it was Mahatma Gandhi who said, you know, uh, it's not about, what did he, how did he say it? It's that um, there is, there's enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I'm not talking about taking, you know, away from the, the super wealthy or anything like that. 
I, all I'm talking about is how do we set up systems so that um, even the lowest paid can actually live okay. There's enough food, there's enough shelter for people to be homeless in this country is inexcusable. So we need to figure out how to uh, how those kinds of things. And permaculture is a tool, it's a way of thinking to actually look at trying to solve those problems. Wow. So there you go, there's, there's a definition of permaculture. <laughs> no, I mean, that's the, you know, as I've, as I've shared with you, so to back up, just for anyone that's listening, I took a, uh, a permaculture design course, which how long, how long are the courses where they, is it 10 weeks? There's, there's 72 hours is, is the content. Yeah. And when we do them live, we do webinars ahead of time and then people come in for eight days and then we go from eight in the morning till nine at night. So it's like 60 hours, 70 hours, just in that week, plus the pre trust But what you went through was 72 hours beginning to end. Yeah. Yeah. So I took that and gosh, well, that was. We did that over a month, over a 30 day period. Yeah. I'm trying to remember when that was in the past couple of years um, that I did that with Bill at Midwest Permaculture, for those of you that are listening and Bill continue year after year, they do online and in-person courses, just in case, you know, if you're listening and you're intrigued by this conversation. Um, and so I did that over the past couple of years. And my biggest thing was what sold me actually on taking the course with you, Bill, which I know I've shared this story with you was, I think, I think one thing that's always fascinated me has, has been just the idea of uh, how do you harvest rainwater? How do you capture water on your property? leverage it to grow things, but also um, to capture it, you know, potentially for that to be your drinking source of water. Now, granted, not something that I've fully implemented at all, you know, where I'm currently at, but I was always so fascinated by that and, and earthworks and swells and just like, how do you design a property to um, get yeah, to, to capture and hold water? And so you're, uh, there's a video of you on YouTube actually doing the earthworks on the clay model. And uh, that was, that was what sold me, for, you know, that uh, I want to learn. I want to, I want to take the course from Bill. <laughs> I want to learn from Bill. And, um, and so anyways, that piece was something that's all in, was very intriguing to me. And I think a lot of times people, like, I think when people think of permaculture, they don't really have like, what is it like, is it like come some hippy dippy thing? Like what is permaculture? But I think when you dive into it, it's really profound. Um, not only at a design level, but I think at a personal level. Um, but I think sometimes people just think like, oh, it's just like in the garden. It's like, no, it, we're talking the design of your home. Um, we're talking about how do you leverage all of the resources, the water, rain coming from the sky. I think a lot of those things were um, really profound for me and is is a lot of what I came out of the course with, but also what I, what I came in wanting to learn more about you know yeah uh, well, let, let's talk about that just say because that is an important piece and it's it's not surprising that that caught your attention this idea of how do we harvest waters so like let's just say you want to design a business or let's say you do want to design a farmstead or a homestead or your yard or your even your apartment um we we design we look at design from the standpoint of how do we do as little work as possible to get the max amount of yield and the way you do that, or efficiency, and the way you do that is you think through these systems so that one system's waste product becomes the fuel or the food for the next system's uh, food. You know, right? Uh, every, there's no such thing as waste. You know, one person's waste is somebody else's food, some kind of a thing. And so we're looking for that kind of efficiency. And when we design, then as we approach that process, we design through what we call the, a scale of permanence. When we're when we're designing on a piece of property in particular. We're designing first around the things that we don't have any control over. Like I have to design around the climate. If I'm in Arkansas, that's the climate. You know, I can't make it snow all winter long, you know, yep. or if I'm way up north, I can't make it warm all winter. It's like I have to deal with the climate. Then the next thing I have to design around is, well, what is my land? What does it consist of? How sloped is it? How what plants are on there? What is the soil like? Uh, those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, how much topography do I have? Um, and then from that, we can move on to, well, then now what's the what's the first thing I can naturally capture off of this landscape that's like rolling out of bed? Like if you look at that let's at a piece of land, if you look at it, what was it like 300 years ago when just the Native Americans were here and they were moving around? 
how much water was being absorbed on that property? If you were near a prairie, I mean, the percolation rate in prairies is like 24 inches an hour. So no matter how much rain came, it all soaked into the ground. And as you get into the trees, it's less because there's less organic matter in the soil. There's a lot, there are a lot of roots, but still the percolation rate in the forest might be six inches an hour, which is a lot. You know, how often does it rain six inches in one hour? So yeah. there wasn't a whole lot of runoff or rain uh, or um, flooding, you might say, in um, in everywhere around. It was always located in certain areas, and that's where they could count on the, on the flooding. But as we've come along and we've moved, removed the prairies, removed the forests, and changed the percolation rate, so now instead of it all running down, it runs across the landscape. Now we're having flooding everywhere, every creek, every river, all throughout the entire landscape. And so one of the first concepts in permaculture, well, that's my water. It's coming out of the sky, landing on my land. Why am I letting it run away? What if I could store it so when there's a dry period, it could go ahead and feed my plants and I could get more abundance. So there's an example of something, what's a simple thing I could do. So it would make sense to me that you would look at that because you're doing a lot of irrigating. Well, can I minimize that? Mm -hmm. And so then we, then we designed from that, we designed through access and then we designed, you know, what are, what kind of systems do we want? Because you don't want to put in a pond or put in your orchard and discover that would have been a perfect place to put the pond is where the orchard is now. I mean, we want to put things in, 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 in a good spot for maximum sunlight, uh, wind protection, whatever it is. And then we designed towards our actual buildings that we're going to be living in. And then finally, our immediate garden by our yard. And then finally, the soil, the quality of the soil that we're growing in. Well, Bill, soil is so important. I mean, I, we should be focusing on that. Yeah, we should. But in a permaculture design, that's the last thing. Because you know what? That's the thing we have the most control over. Yeah. You know, soil is made up of what? Sand, silt, and clay. And then there's a slice of organic matter in there. And the more organic matter you have, the more the more um, air or, you know, the more oxygen and the more water you can hold. It's like a sponge in the soil. That's what organic matter is. If you have very little of it, you don't hold much air and water. But if you have a lot of it, you hold a lot. And that's what plants need. It's the water and the oxygen. Mm -hmm. Or the life of the soil needs the oxygen. But the sand, silt, and clay stays the same. I mean, 300 years ago, wherever those Native Americans are, if you're standing there now, whatever you have below your feet, we have sand, silt, and clay. It's the same particles of sand, silt, and clay that were there 300 years ago. Yep. The only thing that has changed on that landscape is what plants have showed up over those 300 years and how much organic matter is in the soil, and who controls how much organic matter is in the soil on your land or anybody's land? We do. Yeah. So we have control over the quality of our soil, and the more organic matter you get, the more life you get in the soil, and the more life you get in the soil, they access the mineral profile, the sand, silt, and clay, and they produce the uh, minerals that the plants need and also produce the fertility, because a, a little bug, little bits of bacteria, they poop out poop, you know, or or they ex exudate something that resembles, that is fertility for the plant. And so the more bugs you have in the ground, they're basically like having cattle in your soil, livestock or pigs or chickens. They're pooping in your soil. So create life in the soil and, and now you, have, you don't have to fertilize. And we also know that the healthier the plant is, there's this whole science. And we were on this route back in the, 20s, 30s, and 40s, uh, you know, 100 years ago. But there's this whole science of study that there's a point at which a plant can get so healthy that maybe it could become invisible to insect and disease. Mm. Now, this is, a, this is a big one. I mean, you know, this is like, wait, that's what's a bullshit, you know? Excuse me. No. I don't think I can say bullshit on your podcast. But... No, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, obviously, most of us are going to think that's uh, that's impossible, but there has been study after study, and they have been doing this, and there are people that I know who are growing food now, and all they're doing is focusing on, on the soil, helping the soil get as healthy, and the way they do that is they use a foliar spray, maybe once a week or twice a week, with just trace minerals, a little bit of nutrition, and they're giving the plant as much healthy nutrition as they can. They're trying to help the plant reach its a greater genetic potential. And the healthier that plant becomes, it actually develops this, this armor around itself, using basically essential oils. The healthier the plant is, the more robust it is, the more it can protect itself from insect and disease. And literally, there is a point, and they say it's right at the point where the plant reaches about 
50 percent, 40 to 50 percent of its genetic potential. At that point, the plant becomes invisible to insect and disease pressure and yields increase. The plant is healthier. The plant is bigger. So that's where a lot of permaculture people are going. It's like, not, you know, how do I force my plant to do something, but how do I support my plant in becoming as healthy as it can be? You all have friends. We all have relatives. And we know that we can all get in the same environment and four or five of our relatives are going to come home. They're all going to be sick because they're always sick. Their, their immune system is depressed. They, well, I don't know what it is. Usually it has to do with their diet. Usually yeah. they're eating junk food all the time and they don't even realize that that food is your best medicine. And, um, but those who are eating better, getting exercise, those who have a positive outlook on life, we become more resistant, not only to disease, you know, uh, and illness, but we become resistant to negativity. We become resistant to um, being, having bad days. We become more vibrant, more alive, we become more positive in our thinking. And we actually become more helpful human beings. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same way in the plant kingdom, in the plant world, is that um, the healthier the plant is, the stronger it is, and the healthier environment it creates around itself. So I'm in control over how many plants I put on my land. I'm in control of how, how much water I can harvest. I don't know if I told this story in your course, Dirk, but when I started, when we found permaculture, we got started. First thing I wanted to do is I got all this water running off my property, going into the street, and it goes down to the to Kelly Creek. Once it hits Kelly Creek, it goes to the Vermilion River, and from the Vermilion into the Illinois, the Illinois into the Mississippi. Then it comes right down by you to the Mississippi, and then down to the Gulf of Mexico. So as soon as it hits my curb, that water is gone. And so I put in this wonderful system, and you go on our website, and uh, actually midwestpermaculture.com, and there's a thing called free stuff, one of the navigational buttons. And in there is a PowerPoint that describes how we changed our property, how we changed our yard into a real permaculture yard. Also, the clay model is in there the, that you just talked about. So on that page, people feel feel free to go. There's a lot of me. there's a lot of free stuff on the website. Too. Yeah, we really we really want to get this out there. You know, you let people have access to it. Yeah, but we we put in these rain gardens, and there's three of them in the front yard, and uh, there's a, a swale that connects two of them at the front, and then one overflows into the the third one. Didn't. And we put those in in the fall, and it didn't rain for like five or six weeks, and um and finally it started raining. Well, it happened to be on Thanksgiving Day, and um, my parents actually lived next door to us for a while when they were the, the last. 30 years of their life, they lived next door. And my dad's a very private guy. I mean, in that 30 years, he walked over to my house three times to just to check in and say, what are you doing? You know, three times in 30 years. So that's, he's, you know, keeps himself. But we put these rain gardens in and it started to rain that morning. And I had some of my family members would be driving down and to come down and have Thanksgiving with my folks and I. And um, I ran outside with my camera and I had an umbrella on and I'm watching the rain come down the downspout and come down the swale and into rain garden number one. It's a little bit lower. So the first inch of rain goes into rain garden number one. And then rain garden one started to fill up and now started to continue on down the dish into rain garden number two. And it starts going into the... But it's a drizzle. It's not raining. It's a drizzle. I'm running it out of the house with my camera, you know, every 30 minutes or so, you know. And my dad's next door apparently watching this. And finally, about mid-afternoon, he comes outside. Oh, here's one of the times he's walked over to the house. And I'm on the sidewalk under my umbrella. And he goes, Bill, I have been watching you all afternoon. What in the hell are you doing? Oh, well, Dad, I'm, you know, <laughs> I put my hand up. And I don't know, but there's a thumb. I don't know. does some weird stuff sometimes. <laughs> well, well, hopefully it'll go away. All right, we're, we're good. <laughs> I said, so Dad goes, what are you doing? Dad, look at this. It's raining and it's coming down here and it's coming down this ditch and into rain garden number one. And now it's over here into rain garden two. And pretty soon it's going to be high enough. There's a little pipe here. It's going to go underneath the path and go into rain garden number three, you know? And he keeps looking back at me and he's looking at the water and he's looking back at me. And looking back, he goes, well, hell yeah. If you dig a hole and connect your downspot with it, it's going to fill with hole, I mean, with water. Do you mean to tell me people are paying you to, to learn how to do this? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, you got a point there, Dad. <laughs> but we've been doing that for 15 years now. So get this, a million and a half gallons of water has soaked into our lot, a quarter acre lot, 
for the from for, since the first time we put these these rainwater harvesting systems in our yard, a million and a half gallons of water, and anything that we have in our yard now that is perennial in nature, the rhubarb, the asparagus, the fruit trees, the gooseberries, the currants, the raspberries, the grapes, the peach trees. I mean everything. We've never watered those items. We don't go about. We got to water the trees today or whatever. Yeah. Never. All that water has soaked in. There's moisture everywhere underneath our lot. The only thing we water are annuals, the things that are closer to the surface and that, you know, through transpiration and stuff, the, the, the soil dries out. But there's another side to that story. My dad was uh, managed the water and sewer treatment plants here in our little community. We just have 100 houses, I mean, 100 people, 50 houses or so. And he handles our fresh water and then our sewage treatment plant. That was his job. And so at the church he went to in the nearby town, um, they knew him as the water guy out in Stell. And, um, and like I said, my dad kind of keeps to himself. And after we had put these in the yard and um, we, the plants were growing now, and the yard was starting to look pretty nice. We even had their church come out and do a tour through our yard, you know? So he knew we were doing something kind of important, but he said, you know, ah, yeah, I, don't want, I don't like all those holes in my yard. He's got a, you know, $4,000 zero radius turning mower you know he wants to get out there and mow everything doesn't want to have to mow around a tree or something yeah yeah but it was about several years later and he walked over to the house he literally knocked on the door and it kind of surprised me you know because he's it's so rare and he had a book in his hand he said bill uh, the ladies at the church they know i'm the water guy in Stell, and they read this book and they said oh this is for roger and so they gave me this book he said i just spent today reading this thing and i want you to know i realize now it's not for me. It's for you. And then the name of the book is called When the Rivers Run Dry. And in this book, it talked about how we've gone, as we've developed our country, we've gone and we've removed so much vegetation that water doesn't soak in anymore. It runs away. And when it runs away, you slowly dehydrate the entire continent and you create flooding situations whenever it is raining. And they said, they said, the only solution to this is we have to hold water on the landscape where it falls. And I'll just put the forest back in, put some of the prairies back in, put in ditches and stuff that will ha have lots of water with deep roots. I mean, have lots of water, lots of plants with deep roots. So water gets soaked into the ground and even farm regeneratively. So you always have living roots in the soil that can absorb water. You should have a percolation rate of at least four inches an hour in order to hold a typical rain event. And, uh, and there are some farmers in North Dakota that started with a half an inch of percolation, and now they're down to eight to 10 inches per hour of holding water. And that's because they have living roots on the soil all the time. They have a crub crop all the time, but they grow wheat, they grow corn, and they raise livestock cattle through that. And they are some of the most profitable farmers in the country. So yeah, that's, and I wanna, I wanna that's hit, the way to do this. I want to hit on that because... So Stell is a small town. Give us a little bit of an idea, because I know a little bit about Stell and the, and the geographical location. So share a little bit more about Stell, the location and what all surrounds it and what it, that landscape is like. And then I want to go back to what you were talking about with some of the regenerative approaches to having living roots always in the ground. With right. the coffee crops. Yeah, I've always been, um, actually, the one of the books that changed my life, um, I had uh, grown up in the suburbs of Chicago, and I did a little bit of college, but it just didn't sit with me, and I ended up going to Montana, and it was when I quit college and went to Montana, I started reading books, all of a sudden I became interested in life, and one of the books that changed my, my mind and my thinking was a book called Food is Your Best Medicine by Dr. Henry Beeler. And in that, it just it became crystal clear. If you just put junk in your body, how is your body going to produce health? You have to have healthy items. And in continuing in that research, in that vein, well, how come we're not told this in our culture? Well, you look into medicine and you look into education and all these institutions, they're really not designed to get the best of anything for us, but rather to keep a system going. And, and so there's, I realized that there's a hidden, a hidden world that, that we're missing. And one of those was community. And that is that the communities that work best, particularly in rural towns, where you knew your neighbors and, you know, somebody died and everybody brought food over and you make sure someone chopped wood for the widow. And I mean, you just took care of one another. This is a natural thing. And I ached for that experience myself. And so I was looking for to live in a place like an intentional community. And um, anyway, this little town popped up here in Illinois 
And I learned about it and I came to check it out. And the reason this popped up is there was a group in Chicagoland area that had this vision that we as humans could do a lot better, that we could raise children and, and live together in such a way that uh, we really can uh, evolve emotionally and spiritually. It wasn't a, it wasn't a religion, but it was very philosophically oriented, you know, like, you know, higher thoughts, better thinking, love your children, care for your children. You know, and the most important profession was the profession of parenting. That appealed to me, you know, and the second most uh, important profession is that of caring for the land and providing food that's healthy for people. Well, I, I got to check this place out. So I came here to check it out in the immediate area. And there, by the way, their idea of a utopian community, you would say, it actually looks like a suburb. OK, so people from the city build a suburb right out. But they bought a farm in the middle of nowhere in Illinois. We are the smallest county in the in the state of Illinois. They just bought a farm and all of a sudden they you know crossed off 40 acres and they started building their houses in this in this little community. And um and everybody around here thought it was a cult or something because like all, all the farmers like who are these weird people from the city coming in and it, it was hilarious. But as an intentional community there was a drive here to let's create a better world, all right? And so I came in some of the not the earliest days but I came at the tail end of that process. And uh, but what happened is it started to fall apart. And that's because we actually we didn't have the spiritual and emotional maturity. We could agree on a vision. We couldn't agree on how to get there. And that really one of the founding people and the one that kind of was spearheading that kind of the uh, the the I, I call let's call him a leader. He had leadership qualities, but it was a democratic situation. So we actually there was a point where we voted him out. But he actually started uh, philandering and 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 you know messing around with other people's wives and stuff. And that that's a death nail for a lot of things where people get together and people give their power away, and you start philandering and it just it just creates this chaos. So the place fell apart in 1982. So it started in 72, fell apart in 82, and a, th a third of the town just left. I mean, people just they walked away. But the houses don't leave, the street doesn't leave, the water and sewer treatment plant doesn't leave, and I didn't leave. Yeah. I stayed behind because I was still interested in community. And so since 1982, we created a homeowners association. So how many years is that now? 82, 40 years, 42 years. It's just been a town, a town of still. So anybody can live here. But in the surrounding area, there are still people that, well, I, mean, I think there may be cultish over there or whatever. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fun, I've gone to the public schools and we're involved in government and everything else around here. And so most people know that we're just we're just regular folk. But we are, not we are, many of us here, we don't longer live in what was considered an intentional community. But there are some of us here that live with intention. And the intention is, how do we, how do we experience the greatest quality of life? And how do we support a system that, that others can benefit from that as well? So like we have a tool cooperative here that I started with a couple of my friends 40 some years ago, and we still have it. And instead of it started with just a lawnmower and a weed whip, but now is there's a pressure washer and a table saw and a log splitter and ladders and garden carts. And so I've raised four boys out of our small home of, you know, 1900 square feet. And I've never had a basement and a garage. But that's because all the tools were over here in this garage over here. And anytime I needed some, I just went and got it. Yeah. I've never had to own that stuff. Yeah. But I've had access to it for all these years. Now, there's an example of cooperation and sharing that's like rolling out of bed doesn't take any you know it's no big deal but um but it had someone had to organize it and there are times when you know you gotta step up and you know we gotta clean out the shop and everything else like that so there's work involved in working with people but that's the overhead of community right. i would much rather deal with some people that are having trouble they, they return the the rototiller with mud on the tines and now we have to have a meeting because someone returned the rotor tiller with mud on the tines. And I just, you know, we can work this out. Okay. This is not crisis. This is not the <laughs> reason to go to war. Yeah. So, so anyway, so that's the place that I live in, but we are absolutely surrounded by industrial agriculture. Absolutely. But fortunately for us, there is one piece of land that was part of the original community. When the community folded or changed, that piece of land was sold off and was sold to one of our residents who was definitely interested in raising livestock organically. So the farm to the south of us, Mint Creek Farm, raises all kinds of livestock. And so we no longer have to worry uh, what's happening to the south and to the immediate west of us. But north of us and east of us, that's, you know, we actually have, you know, airplanes that come down and spray 
you know, hopefully the wind is blowing in the opposite direction. So we have the um, industrial ag going on uh, uh, surrounding us. Yeah. But I mean, when you look on, know, yeah. When you look on Google maps, it's like, and you type in still, it's like, which I encourage yeah. someone that's actually listening, right? If you're listening, just look at it. It's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty cool because it's the only green, you know, patch in a massive radius. Of right. If you, if you look at the uh, Google maps, uh, you know, most of the year, you know, the fields around us are in industrial agriculture. There's only stuff growing out of four months out of the year. And one of those months it's drying, you know, getting ready for harvest. So it's turning brown. But the rest of the time, everything's off the field. And there's usually, if at best, you're lucky to have a uh, winter wheat growing. That's pretty much it. But I mean, and that, and that kind of takes <laughs> me back a little bit where I want to go with the conversation is, is you've got, you've got two worlds of, you know, at, at the industrial level of farming of, Hey, that, that field's only grown food four months out of the year. So the rest of the year, the sun and the rain is and the snow. Yep. It's obliterating that soil, eroding yep. it. Yeah. The lot, the, I mean, it's, it's turning completely lockless. Yeah. But we also have seen now, which is a lot more popular, I know, and has gained a lot of steam, which is exciting, is a much more regenerative approach. And so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that, because I know, I know, uh, like Gabe Brown's book, Dirt to Soil, was a big book that, that had an impact on me. And I know you, yeah, me too. you've gotten to uh, learn a lot from him. So, so tell us a little bit more about, I mean, we live in this world like we so much of our our uh, incredibly fertile cropland in America has just, I mean, it's 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 next to gone, yeah. um, and now we're so dependent on uh, so much of <clears throat> chemical fertilizers and pesticides. I mean, it's just, can we reverse it? I believe we can, but I don't know. What are what are your thoughts on on all that? Yeah, well, I'm I'm seeing it all the time. Um, I subscribe to. Understanding Ag, and this is Gabe Brown's, uh, one of his organizations, along with a couple others, Alan Williams and Ray Archuleta. So Understanding Ag, and I get their newsletters now. I took their training, which is a, I think it's a thirteen, fourteen hundred dollar training, and now it's available online for five hundred bucks. And anybody who's farming, if you don't take this training, you are absolutely missing the boat. Because I need to do it. I need to yeah, do it. it is absolutely worth its weight in you know gold times ten. Um, and then they also set up the Soil Health Academy. And so through those two organizations, where one's really super focused on soil, the other one's super focused on productive farming. Um, so now it's not just because one guy did it and he was just lucky. Um, Gabe, uh, I mean, Gabe did an interview recently that I caught maybe three weeks ago even. And he's saying, you know, one of the things that's really exciting about this is that now that we've been doing this for about 10 years, he said, we have helped over a thousand farmers transition from industrial agriculture to regenerative agriculture. They're even certifying land now as regeneratively grown. So now you can buy food as regeneratively grown. I mean, that's just starting. It's in the earliest stages. Yeah. But he said, what is amazing about this process of all those thousand farmers that we've introduced this to that have made that change and have moved in that direction. He said, not one has gone back to industrial agriculture, not one. Once you realize that you don't need herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizer, you keep living roots in the soil. That's the key, is have living plants in the soil. I mean, literally, they harvest their crop before the crop gets set up. In other words, they put in the corn, let's say. And before the corn gets you know, a foot and a half high, they come in and they seed a cover crop in between the rows of corn. So now that cover crop is coming up, but the corn is coming up. Find the corn, you know, and so the cover crop isn't doing great because it's in the shade, but it's alive. And then they come in and they harvest the corn crop. And here's the cover crop coming in lush and green. And at that point, they might seed in or drill in like a winter wheat crop on top of that. And now um, that stuff is growing until finally things slow down in the, in the, you know, in the northern climates, you know, in the winter period. And then everything just kind of sits there. But those living roots are in the soil. The life that's in the soil has a place to live. It has food. It has shelter. And so it's all still alive. And there's water percolating. The snow is melting as long as the ground isn't frozen. There's water percolating even in the wintertime. And now spring comes and all of those early plants that don't need warmth, they just, they spring up. That field fills as this lush, green, thick mat 
of vegetation. And, and Gabe is at the point where he's putting in 15 different items as a cover crop on his farm over winter. So this thing comes in as a hedge of field wide. So the vegetation is three and four feet high. And now it's the first or middle of May, time to put the corn crop in. And he puts this big roller crimper on the front of his tractor. And this thing rolls forward and pushes all of this vegetation flat down onto the ground and behind him, either right behind him or in the in the next pass, but he tries to do it one pass. He pulls the planter that is coming in with um, a coulter that slices through uh, the mat and then two little discs that open it up. They drop a seed, whether it's beans or corn, if that's what they're growing. And then another wheel that comes in, pushes them together and flattens it down. And now because all that plant vegetative matter was rolled over and it was crimped, in other words, there are these big metal things on there that actually crimp it. You take a piece of grass and you crimp it here, crimp it here, crimp it here, crimp it here. Because it's on the ground and it's been crimped, it's still alive. And so the plant is bringing up nutrients, trying to keep the plant alive. It's pulling nutrients into the stem, but it can't make it. It can't do it. And slowly over a period of two to three weeks, that entire mat of vegetation turns into a brown mulch and your crop of beans or corn is coming up through that mulch. And now the ground is covered all through the season with a mulch. The soil stays cool even in the summer. And as the corn gets up or the beans get up, they might come in and drill in a cover crop to come in behind the crop when it fills out. It's incredible. The soil is alive. All they're spending money on is seed yep. and, running, and running a pass through the field. No more herbicides, no more pests. Right? Literally, some of these farmers have eliminated it. Now you add in the element of grazing and not just throwing livestock out there and letting them wander around. That's called set grazing. We talked about that in the course, but they're doing high intensity grazing. They're mimicking how the bison used to move through the, the uh, Midwest. And they basically are eating everything down in this paddock. Then they're moving them the next day to this paddock. So they're moving them every day. You know, and I look at that and I said, wow, who the hell's got time to move livestock every day, right? And, and, and Gabe and some of these guys, they just laugh and they just say, you can't believe how easy it is to yeah. set up a single little wire, you know, electrical things, solar panel, you know, you move around. As long as you get water to your livestock, they said it is so easy. I mean, literally, it's taking them 30 minutes a day. And now they're bringing the livestock in and it comes in. It's got this vegetative mat this high. The livestock come in and they don't eat it all the way to the ground, nip it down till there's nothing left. They leave about five, six inches behind. And now they take them off and they don't let them come back onto that field. So now that five inches starts photosynthesizing. That's a lot of photosynthetic material still. Yep. And it just shoots up and the roots are already down. That plant just recovers and that whole field recovers very quickly. So when you were talking about when you, when you move livestock that way over a paddock or a pasture, they are literally, when you look at like how many, you look at a field and the typical thing is how many bales of hay can I get off of that field per year? So wherever you are in the country, you got a number on, in your area. And there are farmers that are doubling that. And there are now farmers that are tripling that. So they have one farm, but they've doubled or tripled the amount of vegetation coming off of that field because it's when they graze it is what's really important. And now the other thing is because they have a strong polyculture on there, it's not just alfalfa, it's not just ryegrass, it's not just fescue, it's a polyculture of 15 different items and some of the stuff has already dried dried back. So there's a lot of roughage with the green material. And what does a ruminant animal want? It wants roughage. You give you give a you give a, a cow, here's a pasture and here's a hedge. It will go to the hedge every single time. It wants the leaves and the woody material more than it wants the grass. Mm. All right. But when you have a field and you have plants in there that they don't graze that thing, but every hundred to 120 days, that's a little over three months. So they hit that field twice a year. That's it. Yeah. But now they come through and it's just this massive, thick amount of grass or material. And they just gorge themselves and then they move to the next. And they're putting massive amount of weight on the animals. But the animals are getting so much diversity because of the cover crop that's in there and the roughage. Their vet bills are plummeting. Yeah. The amount of meat going on the animal is climbing. And the animals are incredibly healthy. And what's more important than anything well, two things. The meat is the healthiest meat you can buy on the planet. It is loaded with minerals, you know, enzymes. It's just alive. Oh, and number two, you're profitable, very profitable. 
And that's the reason these farmers aren't going back. They are making money. And now they see their soil coming alive. They see water soaking in when it rains. They're farming again. These guys are like, oh my God, this is so satisfying yeah. Yeah. to farm like this. I Now I get up every morning and try to figure out how do I get more life on my farm yeah. rather than get up and say, what do I got to kill today to protect yeah. my crop? I'm going to kill that fungus. I'm going to kill those insects. And when you kill that fungus and that insect, you kill everything else. Yeah. All the birds, you know, all the worms, you kill everything. And now they get up, they say, how do I get more life on my farm? And these farmers are just thanking Gabe and these guys, thank you for bringing this. And even the universities are still pushing back. They're still resistant. The industry is, I think they're starting to freak out a little bit. Because money. people are just <laughs> I'm not spending money on, on fertilizer. I'm not spending money on uh, um, pesticides, herbicides. Yeah, I mean, we know the universities. I mean, not... I don't, I'm not painting everyone as bad people, you know, but we do know that the university yeah. with the with Monsanto right. and the large, you know, chemical companies, like it's just, it's pretty clear, but you know, and that's not even to mention aside from that, the yields that, <laughs> that these guys are getting is, is absolutely mind boggling. Yeah. So Gabe, without any of the herbicides, because he's still getting more corn per acre, more wheat, whatever he's growing. He's in he's in uh, North Dakota, and not just Gabe, but I mean, talk about you know other farmers all over that he's been really to people that I've met. They're not only their yields are not only at least consistent, if not better, than their neighbors in terms of just that one crop, but now they're also getting a crop of beef if they're bringing the livestock through there, right? Yep. So now that's another income off of that you know that they didn't have before, and they're not spending money on herbicides, pesticides, or fertilizer. Yep. <laughs> it's like, Oh my God, they're three times, four times more profitable than they were before. Well, you've got all that fertility. I mean, if they're rotating the they're rotating the cows through not only that, but also all of the organic matter from the cover yeah. crop. I mean, it's just yep. you basically are closing the loop, you know, to an extent basically on all of your fertility. When yeah. they lay that crop down, they roll that thing down. And sometimes they'll bring the livestock through first before they run the roller crimper. Then they bring the roller crimper in behind and squish in the manure and everything else like that, right? Um, but when you roll that down and the plant slowly dies on the surface in a mat, the roots underneath, they start to die too. But now you have the roots of the plant that you put in there that you want to harvest, the corn or the bean. And now it's finding not only the nutrients it needs, but it follows the literal pathways that are already established by the roots that are there. And then just following that, that same pathway down and getting all the, all this organic matter and the life of the soil comes in to eat the organic matter. And they're pooping all around the rhizosphere of that root and providing uh, fertility. So it's like no fertilizer is necessary. And now you do that in an orchard as well. So instead of just having your apple trees or your fruit trees, and rather just having apple trees, why not have five, four or five different varieties of trees that all that all ripen at the same time in a row? I mean, that's what some farmers are doing where, you know, this is my, my late June row, you know, this is my mid-July row, this is my late July row, August row, and they have all the variety of fruit. And then in between, the rows have a uh, cover crop in between, a big diversity of grasses, and they go in and they mow it maybe three times a year. I mean, they let that thing grow up about this high. Mm -hmm. And um, But then in between the plants themselves in the actual row, they've got all kinds of deep-rooted plants that are known as mineral accumulators or nit 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 nutritional or nut <laughs> nitrogen accumulators. So plants that actually mine the soil and bring up and leave them in their body when their bodies die, those nutrients and minerals are available to the surface of the soil and to the uh, plants, uh, to the overstory trees. And so they're doing the job of protecting the soil and uh, producing life in the soil. And, um, and and some of them are actually growing vegetables you know, in between the trees as well. So just, there's just, there's no end to the creative way that you can approach this. It's, and it's very exciting, but it takes a lot of skill. I mean, to, to, to understand these systems and understand what plants to put in and, and, um, and when to do it, it's, a, it's an art, but it's an art worth learning. And it's an art that uh, leaves the planet in better condition than when we arrived. And if a farmer can become a millionaire while they're actually, you know, I'm being a little bit Pollyannish here, but I've seen it with my own eyes. I've met these people who have transitioned their farm. And it was scary as hell. And all the neighbors were talking about them. They still are. The neighbors are still laughing 
at these farmers. Yeah. And he, they're, but they're the ones going to the bank and have a big bank account now because they've made that transition. I talked with a young man who was working on this and he's the third generation on his, their family farm. He's just 28, 30 years old, maybe. And uh, within two years, he was able to quit his job. He says, Bill, I'm making so much money. You know, even my wife is going to be able to quit her job because we can actually make a living off of our farm now just by moving our livestock. And now they aren't selling their their livestock on the commodities market. That's her, their income now is selling a calf or quarter cow at a time and connecting the customer with a butcher. And then, you know, so that there, there's more hands on in the selling end of it, but they can also get twice or three times more per pound for that meat by connecting the butcher with the with the customer. So customers are buying a quarter or a half a cow at a time, filling up their freezers and um that's much easier than selling hamburger by the pound, you know, that kind of stuff. But that could be the two. There's a lot of farmers that are doing that. I mean, they set up some some coolers uh and they're on their farm and people come and they just pick up all the all the products that they want. And when they run out of something, they wait until, you know, it comes in again from the the butcher. Yeah, they're still in the stack those enterprises and then they're they're kind of feeding one another, you know, I mean, all the, the, the intensive grazing is helping then, you know, grow the, uh, the commodity crop. And it's just, uh, yeah. And one of the things that, that this is another art though, but this is an area of farming that some farmers don't want anything to do with. And I, I understand that, but you know, you need to be in relationship with the people buying your food, you know? So now that this is where the marketing comes in, you have to be involved with, and what people are buying is number one, they're looking for the healthiest food they can buy. There are some people that are desperate to find food that isn't laced with some kind of, you know, GMOs or herbicide or pesticide or something. So they, they're looking for that, but the, um, uh, for their health. Um, well, I had another thought. I can't remember where I was going. Boy, this is happening more and more. All the time. <laughs> I'll call you tonight when I remember what I was going to say. <laughs> no, that's okay. Just, just, I mean, just the marketing of the food and being in relationship with with people is, uh, in some cases, that's a piece that a farmer is going to have to cross that um, Rubicon. But um, but more and more, there is this, the demand is getting stronger and stronger. You know, I should tell you, and I think we talked about this, Gabe, um, uh, Dirk, but um, do you remember um, we had the um, the student come? She's actually the chief executive officer of Simple Mills. I yes, I remember you talking. Yeah. yeah. So I was just actually, I've been back in touch with her. And we just talked a couple of weeks ago. They created, so she came and took a course. And, and Simple Mills, as you know, maybe some of you have seen their product. They have a cute little son. And uh, they make some of the most, the tastiest crackers and bread mixes and cake mixes and stuff. And, um, but they sell it all over all through the country. She's a millionaire now. But she just she was just dedicated to find creating the best food she can. So organic was the word. So she was buying organic this, organic, you know, almonds and nuts and grinding yep. up seeds of different kinds and making these delicious crackers so that you you and your kids can eat this stuff as much as you want. And at least you know you're not ingesting poison. You're getting a little bit of sugar, but you're getting a whole lot of it's healthy sugar, and you're getting a lot of healthy minerals in with your food. You're getting real food in your food. And then she came and she took the course and I could just see her jaw drop when we got into this section of the course where we looked at it farming and that now a person cannot just have to be an organic farmer, but you can be a regenerative farmer. You'll be organic as well, but now you're taking care of the planet as well. You're yeah. healing the soil, you're harvesting water, you're producing even healthier food. Organic food isn't necessarily super healthy. It just doesn't have chemicals in it, right? So you can have organic food that's actually almost lifeless cardboard but you can also have organic food those of us who've grown a garden and you know we've eaten out of our our own cards we know how, what food, we know what a tomato tastes like it's not what it, what you get in the store right <laughs> yep. so anyway this this just like she was stunned that she didn't know about this and she went back from the course and she went back and she created a department at simple mills and said look your job or our job now is to slowly, let's find the regenerative farmers that are growing the products that we need. And if we cannot find them, let's help create them. Let's go to the farmers who are growing those things and ask them if you will farm this way, regeneratively, permaculturally, put in a cover crop. You always have living root in the soil. All the, the basic tenets of regenerative agriculture, permanent agriculture. Yeah. We guarantee we will buy your crop for you at this price, which is a good price. 
And if you need money ahead of time, we'll give you the money ahead of time. They even came up with a grant program. Well, some farmers need even more help to change their equipment around or something. They would, we were offering grants to these farmers. And I'm at a conference a year ago, and people are talking about how in industry now they're changing and that there are even companies that are demanding regeneratively grown food, you know, and this guy says, there's this company called Simple Mills, you know, and they're doing all this stuff. And, and I'm sitting there in the audience, that's Caitlin, you know? So I called her up or I emailed her and I said, guess what I heard today? And she laughed. And that day she had been at a farm in uh, Minnesota and talking to the farmer sitting on a, on a combine. And she sent me pictures of her sitting on this combine and of this farmer that she's talking to. And she said, Bill, this is so exciting to find farmers. And these farmers are thanking me for guaranteeing that they'll, that I'll buy their food. Cause this is how they really want to farm anyway. No. They said, nobody ever asked us to do this. And for us to know where our product is going, they said, this is invaluable for us to know who our customers are. So it's very, very ex exciting and thrilling. Just so powerful because you know that those like people that have gotten into farming and I, I know that, I mean, people have to understand is like, we, this has been generations and a generation was taught a, a certain way of doing things. And, and now we've realized the effects of that and we're in the process of reversing it, but no one gets into no one gets into farming to at least in my opinion to to know that I'm about to douse everything with with glyphosate like I mean I think at the heart of every farmer like they want to go grow great food yeah they do. and and I'm sure there's some bad apples I mean that's in everything but yeah. at the end of the day like these these farmers now are actually like coming alive to the fact like I'm actually doing that like I and I'm getting to care for the earth yeah. and provide incredibly nutrient dense food for you know right. for people um and, and at the same time it's like we you know i think some people were like oh we just need to quit you know like we need to quit growing commodity crops and all that it's like listen like we got it we we need these we need these farms to feed you know the world and to feed yeah. our country but there's a proven system and model now, like we can do it in this way and it, and build topsoil. And I mean, just, I could go on and on. Yep. But it's just powerful to me. Um, this is a paradigm shift. Yeah. This is a, we're talking about a change that started 10,000 years ago. Annual agriculture started about 10,000 years ago, came on really strong, you know, around the time of Christ. And before that, matter of fact, North Africa was a very fertile area. But the Roman Empire, when they finally came into Egypt and took over the northern Africa, they turned that into their grain belt. And that's where they got food to be able to feed all their armies and everything. And they literally turned a fragile environment into a desert. You know, I mean, not the whole thing. I mean, there were deserts there, but um, there were many areas where deltas and stuff where there was all kinds of uh, opportunity for agriculture, but they turned those areas to deserts too, because they basically chewed up all the organic matter in the soil. And now the water doesn't stick, doesn't stay, goes away and it turns into a desert. And so this has happened over and over. This annual agriculture is in our blood. We think farming and we picture a plow. Yes. And actually that is the, that's the piece of from, from, from swords into plowshares. Yeah. And it's the plowshare that actually is doing this, this damage. Now you could use the plow once in a while, but only once in a really long while in very unusual circumstances. But Masanobu Fukuoka, he's the gentleman who wrote One Straw Revolution. He was one of the first ones in modern time to just say, if I have to mine the soil or I have to till the soil, I'm going to use plants to do that. You use a cover crop of plants and they will do the job of opening up the soil, loosening the soil and creating a seed bed for you. Now, the, the hard part has always been terminating what's on top so you get your seed and ground to grow your one item. But now there's a lot of people saying, why am I growing even just one item? So anyway, we're finding these balances now. So we're finding a way. This is huge. This paradigm shift is, it's, this, is this is something that only happens every two, 5,000 years. Yeah. So that's how big this is, all right? And so if I'm a conventional farmer, you know, I'm going to be skeptical, I honestly, you know? And I understand it. And and, and some of my some of the nicest people I know are my neighbors who are industrial ag people, and they look at me kind of like, you know, but Bill, you're kind of the enemy. We like you, but you know, you're talking you're talking on the other side of the street. Yeah. Now, we we all know you can't feed the world, you know, without glyphosate. You can't feed the world without you know genetically modified engineering. Uh, they just know it. They absolutely know you cannot do it. That this is the only option, and that what I'm talking about and what Gabe and everybody else. 
is um, off campus. It's it's off base, right? Yeah. But um, now that I've seen so many farms that have made this transition, and I know the people, and I've seen the stories, and I've seen their livestock, you, you can't imagine a cow that is just plump. You can barely see their bones anymore. You know, you look at the back end of the rump of a cow, and you can tell, you know, how much weight they're putting on. You can barely see that they're just they're just packed with with meat. <laughs> And it's just you yeah. can't deny it. You just can't deny it. And they're healthy and they don't need medications. Yeah, all from eating plants. <laughs> Dude, it's like, well, yeah, but, all from that, eating right? plants. Good not point. Not from eating, not from eating grain in a feed bar. That's right. Yeah. I mean, the the meat we get from our uh the grass fed beef we carry at our store from our from our uh our partners down in, near us. I mean, which they're they've been doing it for almost twenty years. The, yeah. you know rotational grazing high intensity um i mean it is i mean they have they have a specific they have a specific area of paddocks they rotate them to when they finish them like it's like that that yeah. area is dedicated just for when they're finished them out before they go to yeah. slaughter and i mean it's 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 unreal like when you when you get a piece of steak out and you cook it i mean it's just like mm -hmm. i mean it's so dark red i mean and then you put that next to something you get from the super i mean it's like it pales in comparison. Yeah. And you have people that want to argue, oh, well, there's no nutritional density difference. I'm like, they're just there looking is. at it. There is. <laughs> there absolutely is. And that's coming along too now. So the science is following that. That's something that understanding ag and soil, uh, cat, soil, soil health academy are doing. And that is they're connecting with researchers now who are going in and actually uh, researching the actual products that are coming off of these farms to look at the nutrient density and comparing them to industrial ag. And even some of the bigger companies now, um, there's a there's a movement within General Mills where General Mills is starting to look for farmers who are growing regeneratively as well because they can see the market is slowly turning in that way. You know, and more and more of us are saying, just like, I just, I need food that can feed, that can not only fill my stomach, but can nurture my body. You know, why do I hurt? Why do my, why is my, my vision failing? Why is my hearing failing? You know, why am I getting these warts? Why am I getting, you know, we just think it's part of life that, and that the answer is a really good healthcare program and a hospital, <laughs> you know, and I'm sorry, but the truth is, is that, you know, you go to a hospital and you go to a conventional doctor, you're not going to get very good advice. You're probably going to get more drugs and create more problems. Food is your best medicine. We start there. And if you're going to eat food for medicine, then the food's got to come from healthy soil. Yep. And healthy soil comes from plants. Yeah. You yeah, know, it's, this, it, it, I think we, we got to get close here, but to finishing up, um, although you and I could go on, I'm sure, for a couple hours. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> one of my favorite parts of the course is I talk about every culture in the world has always identified the four key elements, you know, which is water, fire, which is the sun, you know, uh, earth and uh, air. So there's the, the four, right? And that, um, that let's, and I jokingly say, let's suppose that we have a permaculture course and we're on a, a sailboat and we're going on a cruise and that we're talking permaculture, we're cruising around and we're having this great time, but our, but our boat goes down. And fortunately we all survived. We, we you know, we, we find enough gear and we float onto an Island, but, and we're going to be on this Island for the rest of our life. just like Gilligan's Island. We're never going to be rescued. All right. It's just us. Right. And I show this picture of a barren Island of nothing but sand and rock. All right. Now on that Island of sand and rock, is there air? Is there water? Is there sun? And is there earth? And let's say there's even fresh water coming out of the middle of, of, of the, of the, of the of the uh, island, we have all four elements, and how long will we survive on that island? We're dead. Yeah. What are we missing? We're missing the plants. The plants are the great alchemists. They take those four elements, and they literally create life out of thin air. We talked about that too. And how CO two out of the atmosphere, ninety six percent or something of a typical tree is made particularly out of carbon that came out of the atmosphere, the other 4% of the minerals that it extracted from the soil. And when that tree goes down and it basically hits the forest floor, give it 20, 30 years, and it basically gets chewed up by the life of the soil, that entire tree goes back to the atmosphere, the carbon. The minerals stay there, but the carbon goes back to the atmosphere. 
So life comes out of thin air, literally, and plants come out of thin air. And it's the plants that create the abundance on our planet, filters water, produces food, shelter, clothing, all the things that the human and the animal kingdom need in order to survive. But you remove the plants and you're removing life on the plant planet. And to have an agricultural field that grows one item for three to four months out of the year, and then it's a desert, agricultural desert the rest of the year, we are basically just shooting ourselves in the foot or the head because we're not even producing healthy food when we do that. We feed it to cows and they produce meat that's not all that healthy. So it's it just makes sense. And that's this is what permaculture is. It only asks two questions. It asks what is and how do things really work? All we're doing is looking at how did nature set this up? How did the creator, how did he or she or it do it? Yep. How, how is the thing works? How does this work? And then all we're doing as co-creators saying, let's work with the way we co-created things already or the way the creator created it. And let's work with the creator to create abundance. Let's put more plants in the ground. You know, let's get more healthy food. Let's create security and abundance for ourselves, our family and our neighbors and then eventually for the entire continent and the entire world. And we can do it. And in the process of doing that, we can stop flooding, most flooding, we can stop most droughts, you know, and um, and we can clean up our water and clean up our air. Just by putting carbon back in the soil, we can pull out all the excess CO2 in the atmosphere. If CO2 is causing climate change, we literally could reverse or retard global climate change. But if pulling the CO2 out of the atmosphere, atmosphere, that's how you do it. And you store it in the plants and you store it in the soil. For every 1% increase in organic matter, you increase the amount of carbon you pull out of the atmosphere by massive amounts, thousands of pounds of carbon out of the atmosphere just to add 1% organic matter. And for every 1% organic matter you add to the soil, you now can hold another acre inch of water, which is 27,000. 154 gallons. Wow. So it's pretty easy. It's easy to understand. And that's one of the things we do in this permaculture course is we just kind of go through this whole process. And um, and as you saw when you took it, it's just one thing leads to the next and leads to the next. So when you come out, you just realize there is a way to do this. <laughs> I understand it now. And, uh, and I know it now. And that's why we even cover things that we know people aren't going to go out and, you know, build a house in the middle of the woods or something like that. But we show the thinking and the, the science behind how do you do this thing so that you know it can be done almost anywhere. And then people come out, they just know, OK, there's a way for us to do this. We as human beings can become uh, more capable. But one of the keys to this whole thing happening is that to create a more permanent culture, the Achilles heel in this process is really us as the human beings. We could have been doing this for the last thousand years, but we're not doing it. We, we're allowing certain interests to push our cultures in certain ways and to do things that really aren't the best for us. And we just kind of are going along. And so one of the things that has to occur, and this is our early um, founders of our country, that's why education was so important. It's just like we need an educated populace. We need people to understand how things really work. And um, and then we can make better and better and wiser and wiser decisions. And that's true. So we need to build our uh, emotional and spiritual maturity, as well as our understanding and our intelligence of how things really work. And then may have the courage and the strength to make those changes. For you to farm the way you're farming took a lot of courage and strength. It was not easy. There are times where you just want to give up. Everybody who's been doing this, there are times you just want to give up because it's so damn hard. But you realize how important sometimes this work is. And you just say, well, I got to do something with my day today. Why don't I go ahead and see if I can't figure out a way to do this easier. And so we get better and better and better at it. But when a, when a, when a group of people put a plan together and it falls apart, whether you're forming a church or whether you're forming a, a farm or a small community, when it falls apart, it's never the design of the building or the design of the farm. It's the people involved. We lack the emotional and spiritual maturity to be able to work with one another and understand and to forgive and to have patience and to have empathy. Those are all skills. Mm -hmm. And we have to develop those skills as well. And so, you notice in the course, we talk about that. Yeah. And we, we talk about how, you know, we got to grow up. We're a culture, as I say, we're a culture of seventh graders. 
you know, and, you know, mom and dad are gone, you know, and, and, you know, we're having a party and the doors are open and the furnace is on and the stereo is on and the TV's on, the refrigerator door is open, the liquor cabinet's open. We're just running around. And that's our culture. Yeah. That's us. You don't like me. I don't like you. That's seventh grade, right? You don't like my friend. I don't like your friend, you know, or whatever. You're my enemy. You know, it's a, the ridiculous stuff, but that's who we are as a culture. Yeah. And we have to figure out that part of the journey to creating a more permanent world, a permanent culture, to create a better world, is we have to grow up too. And it's a, lot, a lot of the greatest minds out there, you know, the spiritual teachers of every religion, they basically say, you got to stop whining. You got to stop complaining. You got to own the dramas that are coming up within you and realize you're, when you get into traffic and you get upset, guess who's creating the upsetness? It's you. not the traffic, it's you. You know, it's me. You know, it's the same thing when you're dealing with people. When you're dealing with someone and you feel upset by them, you know, somebody else doesn't get upset with it. You get upset with it. Guess who's creating the upsetness? We are. We have to learn about that. And that's and that's where the universal lang the language of permaculture comes in. You know, I've taught courses in the university settings. I've taught, you know, nine courses at the Shivananda Yoga Ashram, which is a, a derivative of the hin Hinduism. I've taught um, at uh, Cal Earth, you know, four or five courses at Cal Earth, which is uh, inspired by Rumi and Islamic teachings. I've taught at uh, at a Christian uh, camp or area where a lot of Christian families came in, a lot of our preppers and stuff, you know. And um, and I even taught I taught at a at a at a hippie commune community. You know, this is a um, a, a a real uh, eco village kind of a thing. You know, yeah. a lot of bare feet and long hair and stuff like that. <laughs> I teach I teach the same course no matter what setting I'm in. Yeah. And everybody gets involved. Everybody gets excited. And sometimes the same people, these different people are in the same course. And they come up to me and they say, you must know the Lord. This is this is what we read when I read the Bible. Oh, you must know uh, uh, Muhammad because this is this is in all the Islamic writings. This is here. Oh, you must be Hindu because this is in the Hindu writings that we have to care for creation and, and that we have to take responsibility for ourselves as well. I mean, it's universal. And why are people responding to this? Because it's what is and how things really work. Mm -hmm. And what is and how things really work is that when we want to participate in the world and we want to experience happiness or joy or uh, participation in, world, in the world, there's only, there's only one way that you could do this or several things you got to do. And everybody through all time, whether you're living now or a thousand years in the future or a thousand years in the past, there's only one way to get there or one basic way. And that is you have to own your own process. You have to make a contribution. You have to be growing. You have to be learning. You have to be evolving. You have to be becoming more mature. You have to have some kind of useful service to the world. What is it that I can do to contribute to the world and not just to my family, but to things in, 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 in a larger scope and take care of it? You know, and then um, fourth, you have to be of service in some way. So oftentimes the work and the service are the same, but you have to have this mindset of caring for creation. Do you think God cares for us? Does God love us? I mean, I don't know. It seems to me he probably or she probably does. Mm -hmm. And that we need to do the same thing. How do we love creation? And loving creation means loving your neighbor. It means loving the soil. It means loving the wildlife. It means loving the future, creating things so that they're better for future generations. That's permaculture. Yep. There's a definition for you, a one hour <laughs> definition of permaculture. Yeah, that was incredible, Bill. And and for, for those of you all listening, if, if this is, you know, awakened a, a light bulb, a turn the light bulb on in your head and say, man, I want to learn more. You can, you can do that at uh, Midwest Permaculture. Go to the website. They've got a ton of educational offerings. And again, as I said earlier, in person, online, um, you know, I think that, I think that for me, I came out of it with this, like, whoa, there's a, there's so much more than just, oh, this is how to design a, uh, a property, but you come out it with it, with a, I think a, a really holistic view and, and just, yeah, it just changes the way you see things. Um, some kind of a shift that occurs yep. and all of a sudden you realize I could do this. I, I could contribute here. Yep. And and you also realize I got things that I need to do kind of to um, grow myself. Yeah. Well, thank you. you know, for... This is what's, this is what's different from when you took the course, you had to show up, 
and we did every single night. But now the course is recorded. It's me basically doing interviews like this, but they're teaching sessions. And people can actually get these recordings now. That's the online PDC course that we sell. And it's like a third of the price of being in person, all right? So the in-person course is 1800 This is, I think it's 700 for six six ninety five. dollars yeah. If you want the certificate, if you don't want the certificate, it's only four ninety five. All right. So I mean, for five hundred bucks, right? So you get this entire course, and it's it's us going through, and it's me and my other instructors, and we do the exact same thing that we gave to Dirk. It's the literally the exact course. It might have. I think you were in course number ninety four, and this was course number ninety three that we actually took those recordings and made this um, um, recorded session. And then for those who want every uh, semester or every uh, season. Um, we come on and we basically over a nine week period uh, on a Monday night, as we've set up now from seven to nine or seven to eight thirty, uh, people come in and I say, OK, everybody listen to, to webinars one and two. And then they come in and we talk about those. And now listen to three and four. Then they come in, we talk about those. And so we get together and we explore what was the meat and the juice from each period. But it's only and if you can't make that, we record those anyway. So uh, it's really accessible. The course is accessible now. And I'm, I can't tell you how excited I am because I've taught over a hundred of these courses, you know, oh. with a room full of people. <laughs> and to me to finally have recorded it and got it in a package now, and it's really well put together, I think, you know, and our, you know, Milton and Megan have been amazing at their ability to help me with this. But now there's in this, it's in this package. So anybody can access it anytime you want. We've got a small group of people from Africa who've just picked it up and are working through it calling in and I call and I check in with them once in a while. So pretty exciting. So it's, it's, it's available and it's accessible now. And that's the exciting thing uh, to me. And uh, there are other permaculture courses out there as well. Many of them are very good. Some of them are not, I don't think very good. So uh, we, we worked really hard to make this as worthwhile and meaningful as possible. And so um, I'm pretty confident. I'm pretty, I feel good about what we've created now. Yeah, well, from someone who's gone through it, you'll you'll definitely have it's uh it's something that I recommend to people, and um, it was super impactful for me. So, yeah. well, Bill, thank you for uh for taking the time to come on, and uh, yeah, I think a lot of people are gonna whoever listens, I think will will really enjoy and uh, just begin to question some things, and I think that's yeah. was kind of the goal for me of this time, and just. Appreciate you sharing your insight and experiences with us. Well, let me, uh, thanks for letting me go. I love talking about this. <laughs> it's pretty important stuff. It just is. It's just like, what, it's just like, you know, we got to live our life, right? And every day we got to get up and do something. And I mean, that's the decision I made a while ago. And I said, well, why don't I just get up and try to create a world that, you know, that works for everybody. Why don't I just try yeah. to, you know, heal things and, you know, what the hell? I got to do something today. Why don't I do that? Yeah. So, but you just keep doing that year after year, and before you know it, you've actually created something. So, yeah, yeah. It's I love the work. Dirk was great having you in class. Thanks for having me on. I love talking about this. So, it'd be fun to check in with you in a year or so, and uh, we'll check in and see what you're doing, and I'll share with you what we're doing, and go from there. Absolutely. Thanks, Bill. Right.